end of the conversation, he said, Dr. Jordan, don't mind if I ask you a personal question? No, fine, go ahead. I read your resume, and it says you're a deaf man. How can you have this phone conversation if you're a deaf man? So I explained VRS to him. But VRS really changed the lives for deaf people because not only can I make telephone calls to hearing people, but I can make VP calls to other deaf people. So use the same equipment, I can call a deaf person anywhere in the United States. And my TV, the other deaf person, it's like uh, enhanced Skype, better than Skype, really clear, I wonder. Second thing that's equally important, this card, card, I remember, computer-assisted real-time captioning, right? That's CART means, I think, all right, thank you. CART, I have, I have a friend who's a deaf man. He's one of the founders of an organization called ALDA. That's the Association of Light Deaf and Adults. And he established a, a company called Caption Access, and Caption Access hires veterans. They don't learn to become stenographers. That you stenographers. <laughs> <laughs> but this, but instead, they work with a computer until the computer learns their speech. And then they listen and repeat. And the computer translates their speech into real-time captioning. I thought, will it work? It's amazingly accurate. It's really, really accurate. So his company, for example, he's located in Chicago. But a college in Arizona has one deaf student, they hire his company who listens on telephone to a lecture in Arizona, sends the captions to a screen in that college in Arizona, almost real time. There's a little, little bit of delay. Wow. Wow. So, that's amazing. I can't, I can't speak to VR work with people with disabilities because I don't know enough about it. You, you know about it. I can speak to the notion that everybody with a disability can have success in a job. Everybody. It doesn't matter the severity of the disability, you can find work that will match that person with a disability. I can also talk to the fact that the biggest barrier that faces people with disabilities hasn't changed very much. I talk about the marvels of technology and how they've helped my life and the lives of other deaf people and technology has also helped people with other disabilities as well. But that one barrier is the barrier of attitudes. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You, you know that. But wow, I, my life's work is trying to change attitudes trying to change what's in people's mind and, more important, what's in people's hearts. Because people see a person with a visible disability, right away they make judgments. Right away they think less of that person. People meet me 
my disability is not visible, but they meet me and they learn that I'm disabled, right away they make judgments. Right away they think I'm less than something. Oh. Oh, it's like mother me. <laughs> when I fly, I, I travel a lot. When I fly, I always tell my seat mate that I'm a deaf person. I, I learn to do that because sometimes if I don't tell them I'm a deaf person, then <laughs> I'm reading, person talks to me. I don't know that person's talking to me. I'm reading, or the flight attendant comes, ask me a question. I don't know what that person's asking me a question. So I try to make it easy. 90% of the time when I do that, people are very friendly, very nice. Oh, thank you for telling me. You know, thank you. And then sometimes they'll tell me that there's an important announcement or something. But 10% of the time I tell them that, oh, they I probably should not say this, but I want to slap them. <laughs> really, when I get that attitude, I really want to slap them. But I know that the best thing to do is just be nice and friendly and cooperative and try to help them learn something about deafness. I'm not an expert on deafness, no. But I'm an expert on being a deaf person because I became deaf in 1965. That uh, that's 50, wow, 51 years ago. I celebrated my 50th deaf birthday. <laughs> 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 I said, a new, new person. So I congratulate you on what you're doing to reach out to young people with disabilities. I serve on a foundation called the Johnson, Johnson Scholarship Foundation, and their mission is to help people with disabilities obtain employment. And a really great foundation, really, really great foundation. And one of their programs works with every state university in the Florida system. There are 12 different universities in Florida. Foundation is located in Florida. That's why they support those 12 state universities. But they work with the disability service coordinator on each campus. And they provide scholarships for the students. Been doing it for 20 years, doing that. And about two years ago, we came to understand that the scholarships are not what's important. The scholarships, they, they enable students to go to college, probably without the scholarships they couldn't go to college. But what's important is the relationship that they make with the people in the disability rights or disability service office. The relationship, the mentoring, the support, the coaching, the follow-up. Well, I thought before I came in this room, that's you. That you're the people who manner them. You're the people who get to know them. You're the people who help Students with disabilities know that they can succeed. We just published a paper. Well, I, I said we published, I don't know if it's published, that we submitted a paper about what we do in the Florida system, and we talk about secret sauce. We talk about how important the secret sauce is, and that secret sauce is People who care, people who believe in the abilities of people who have disabilities. So you're the secret sauce here. And 
your job, role, your life's work is so very important. I am humble and honored to be invited here to, to meet with you. I came because Meg O'Connell, who's sitting way in the back, <laughs> is my friend. We got to know each other when she worked for the National Organization on Disability. And we've met many, many, many times over the years. So when she contacted me and told me what you were doing and then put me in touch, I said, I'd be delighted to come down here. But I told myself I should not talk long. I've already broken that. <laughs> that uh, and that what I want is to hear from you. I would love for people to share experiences or to ask me questions or to stand up and, and talk about your work. I believe in the abilities of people with disabilities. I always give a little speech training lesson to audiences when I talk about that. And I tell them to say the word disability. And if you pay attention, you say disability. So the emphasis is on ability. When you, when you use that word, it's just disability. It's not dis. Ability. It's, uh, your emphasis on ability. So I'm happy you share that belief. And I should stop and invite you to share your experiences, your knowledge, ask me questions about my experiences. I'm blessed. My, my life changed after DPM. I've, I've had maybe the dream job and dream life of a deaf man. But I'm not an expert on deafness and I'm not an expert on disability. You are more of that than I. So help me by asking me questions or talking. Who's first? <laughs> Dr. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. And I, I wish we could take credit. I just wanted to uh, let you know about the beautiful murals behind you. We wish that we could take credit for them. We hired a graphic recorder, and during one of our meetings uh, last winter, she recorded um, the model that we have before you today. So we just wanted to give you that little piece of information. They're really wonderful. They're really, really wonderful. Who has the first question? Thank you for the courage to be the first person to stand up and ask a question. But honestly, I could talk for hours about how that impacted my life. And I think maybe the, uh, the best way to answer it is to tell a short story about, about two months after I became president. I was at the Rhode Island School for the Deaf. 
and I was visiting the school and the different classes, I still had some, oh, this will sound very humble. You saw I was humble. I still had some celebrity at that point. People had seen me on TV, people had seen me in newspapers and knew who I was. So when I went to the school, the uh, superintendent of the school followed me into all the different classrooms. And you know that, that alerted the children in the classroom, something's going on here. So I went to a kindergarten class and I met a small group of kindergartners and the teacher asked me if I would sit down and talk to them. I said, sure. So I sat down on a kindergarten chair, <laughs> small chair. My knees were up here, <laughs> little chair. And the, the kids were really delightful. They asked me, no, five, okay. They asked me, do you have a dog? <laughs> yes, I have a dog. I tell them my dog's name. Uh, is your mother hearing or deaf? It, it was just fun. But while I was talking to these kids, one of them stood up and he walked around and he put his arm on my shoulder and he just stood there. So the teacher wanted to move him. I said, no, he's okay, that's okay, leave him alone. You know, I noticed he just finished playground. So his hands were filthy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very, you know um, <laughs> but it was nice. And then all of a sudden it hit me. He's five. He knows I'm deaf. He knows I'm important because his superintendent is following me and his superintendent is showing me respect. And he's deaf. So he, somewhere in his brain, he said, I can do this. No, I can be successful. And honest to goodness, I left that room, I cried. I really, literally cried about that experience. And what makes it most cool, the next morning, that was the front page of the Providence Rhode Island newspaper. Big picture that somebody had taken of that boy standing there. I still have that picture. I still have it. Later he came to Gallaudet. He graduated from Gallaudet. Right. Great. Great. Next question. Thank you. My name is Charles Wells, and I am the manager here in Macon, Georgia. Uh, I am a person with a disability, and I want to say that when I watched the film, day before yesterday, I've seen it before, it was awesome. I had no idea of the sacrifice that people have made for persons with disabilities. I had read in books when I was in college, but to see it put a new help me it put a new understanding in my mind that this was not easy and this was not granted or given freely. Um, so I want to say how much I appreciate what y'all did. Um, my question is, uh, as you, you, you and some of the others were pioneers to help people with disabilities with their rights and, and, and what do you, if, if you could look in the future 50 years or 100 years from now, what would you want to see? What would you hope to see for persons with disabilities in the world? Wow. So in part, I've already answered that question because if attitudes haven't changed in 50 years, I, I'm glad I won't be around <laughs> to see it. <laughs> that, I really hope that in 50 years, people will recognize ability instead of focusing on disability. So that's probably the most important. But secondly, I think technology, technology goes so fast and changes so much. I think that 
many disabilities that exist now that equipment related technology will help. Many disabilities that exist now, genetic engineering will, will resolve. There won't be those disabilities anymore. So I have this rosy vision for the future that everything will be better than it is now. And if it's not, ooh, I don't know. That movie, I thank you for mentioning the movie. I wish that could be made mandatory at every high school or every middle school or every elementary school or all three. I, I think everybody should see that movie. It's, it showcases ability. It showcases sacrifices. It showcases hard work. But maybe most important for your work, it shows that no matter what the disability, people can accomplish a lot. People can be successful and productive with severe, severe disabilities. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that movie. I was, I was honored to be part of the movie. And every time I watch it, I learn something new. Every time. Thank you. Next question. Yes, John. Thanks. I'm uh, John Cheek. I'm a counselor at the Savannah office here. Um, I felt that when we watched the documentary, one of the uh, climactic moments was the signing of the ADA. And I was just wondering if you could describe to us in a few words what the atmosphere was like, what the emotion was like, and how you felt when that was finally completed. All right. Thank you for asking me that, because some memories in my life, that's one of the top. I was very involved with uh, working, lobbying for, and encouraging the passage of ADI. But before the signing ceremony, I want to tell you a really cool experience. I went to the House when they voted on the ADI. And maybe you've watched House folks. You know, they have an electronic scoreboard that shows I, nay, and the numbers change when the vote happens. So I was sitting up in the gallery, and it happened that one of the members of the Gaudet Board of Trustees was a congressman. And his name Steve Gunderson. He was from Wisconsin. And he could sign. When the DPN happened, he smart man. He said, I need to learn sign language. If I'm going to serve on the God at board, I need to know sign. So he, he learned sign. Not skilled signer, but he could sign. So when I was sitting up in the gallery, before the session started, he and I talked. You know, he was on the floor of the house, I was in the gallery, we're signing to each other. And the other congressman watched what was going on. Then they called the house into session and voted on ADI. And I've never seen anything like it. The, the scoreboard, whatever it's called, 